I'm Anastasia Amoroso, and this is Beyond 6040. On this show, we take a deep dive into the alternative investment space and speak to industry leaders who share their expertise and insights on market trends, the macroeconomic environment, and investing opportunities. Today, we'll start with my market pulse snapshot, and I'll share the one thing that caught my attention this week in private markets. Next, Ryan Cooning of Hamilton Lane joins me here in the studio to discuss private equity secondaries and how his firm is finding opportunities in the current environment. Then we sit down with iCapital Senior Vice President of Research and Education, Sean Hasnat, to talk about opportunistic real estate investing. And finally, I'll share five questions to ask before making a private market investment. Let's get to it. In today's market poll snapshot, the one thing I'm focused on in private markets is private credit. Private credit has grown substantially as an asset class from very little assets under management in 2006 to 1.3 trillion in AUM today, according to Prequin. And even this year, while other parts of private markets are seeing slower fundraising, private credit fundraising in the first quarter of this year is on par with the first quarter of 2022. This is understandable, of course, given the increasingly attractive yield that private equity offers. For example, the yield on the Cliffwater Direct Lending Index is now close to 11%, and that is above the yield to worst or the yield to take out on both the U.S. high yield and the leveraged loan indices. Now, this relatively attractive yield is available for two reasons. First, because most of the private credit is floating rate, the sector is benefiting from the high level of the Fed funds rate. And second, direct lending spreads are typically wider than the spreads for publicly traded, broadly syndicated loans. This is because the loans in private credit are typically issued to middle market companies with smaller revenues or earnings profiles, and the loans are held privately and are therefore less liquid. What's more is that the difference between these two spreads has recently widened out even more. Direct lending spreads are now approaching 600 basis points, while the syndicated loan spreads are hovering around 475. This is, of course, a further advantage for investors looking to earn attractive yield in private credit. Finally, a lot of investors have been asking this question recently. Well, what about valuations of these private credit loans? Don't they have to correct? Well, valuations have been resetting lower already, but there's an interesting dynamic to point out. The weighted average mark on first lien debt actually increased slightly in the first quarter of 2023 to 96.96%, while the second lien and subordinated debt declined to 91.5 and 94.1% respectively. This further underscores the point that a lot of our private credit GPs have been making. The weakness is showing up in the lowest quality part of the market, but high quality assets are holding up well. The bottom line is this, private credit continues to offer an excellent opportunity to investors to earn income in their portfolios over and above cash and over and above inflation. And as regional banks pull back from lending, private credit GPs may use their record dry powder of $462 billion to step up their middle market lending where appropriate. As a result, we see a continued opportunity in private credit. And that's your one thing in private markets this week. Coming up next, I speak with Hamilton Lane's Ryan Cooney about growth momentum in the private equity secondaries market. My first guest today is Ryan Cooney, Managing Director on the Secondary Investment Team at Hamilton Lane. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, great to see you. And look, for 30 years, Hamilton Lane has invested in private markets, with 22 of those years investing in P secondaries. And yet, when I think about private client investors, they're new, relatively new to this world of P secondaries. So break it down for us. What is a private equity secondary transactions? Who is involved in it? and how is it progressing? Yeah, uh, so in its simplest form, a, a secondary investment is essentially buying a limited partner interest from the original investor in that fund. That original investor uh, made a commitment to a private equity fund on a blind pool basis, 
and they become the LP on day one. Mm -hmm. uh, the From a secondary basis, uh, the secondary buyer will come in and work with that uh, original LP and buy that interest and essentially replace that LP who is selling. Uh, a great example that I could give you is, let's say for example, you're a college endowment or a foundation. And um, over the last 20 years, you've built a robust private equity portfolio. And today, you know, for whatever reason, you need some liquidity. Uh, well, you would go to the secondary market and you would work with a group like us, who's a secondary buyer, um, in selling some of those private equity positions. Because this market is different than the public world. If you own a stock and you want to go sell it, you could do so. Private equity, there's no redemption mechanism, right. natural uh, redemption mechanism or liquidity mechanism in it. Um, so you have to work with a group like us and you can sell it on the secondary market. And, and you mentioned, Ryan, sell it for whatever reason. What are some of the reasons that an LP might sell a stake? Well, a host of reasons today. Um, there are a lot of motivations that are driving uh, LPs to the market today. Uh, I would say back in the early days of secondaries, 100% of the sellers were mostly distressed. That's just not the case today. Hmm. There's a huge mindset shift with LPs in the market today. Um, they are focused on their portfolios, whether that be a new strategic plan where they need to sell some of their non-core relationships, or they may want to rebalance or portfolio management type of tactics. Maybe in today's market, uh, which is really happening uh, often, mm -hmm. uh, LPs are selling because they need a little bit more flexibility in their portfolio because they don't have enough of liquidity to do what they want to do. Right. So as the allocation to private markets evolved and private equity evolved and became a greater piece of the allocation, naturally the portfolio management needs arise from that and need for liquidity. So speaking of kind of the size of the market and the deal uh, volumes, uh, Hamilton Lane recently published an article on P secondaries where some of the numbers that you cited that the deal volume in secondary skyrocketed from 20 billion in 2008 to over 800 billion in 2021. So why is it that the market is seeing such great growth momentum? And, you know, part of that question is what do you in the early days, you know, 22 years ago that made you think this is going to be a great growth opportunity? Yeah, the first part of that question behind the growth of the market, um, there's really three factors. Number one is the, the overall growth within the private markets. Um, the private markets are growing annually 15 to 20 percent. Today, they're sitting on north of seven trillion dollars of value. We as secondary buyers view that as our inventory. Every one of those dollars is a secondary opportunity. Right. And uh, historically, as an industry, we've purchased one to two percent of that. So a lot more growth. There's a lot more options. This is the second growth driver. There's a lot more options in the market today for buyers. Back in 2009, there was one type of secondary transaction. Today, there are multiple types of transactions, both on the LP side and the GP side. The third uh, growth factor is just the mindset shift. What we talked about a little bit earlier, the LPs are thinking about this differently. The GPs are thinking about this differently as well. Uh, they are using it to their benefit on the GP side. While the LPs may be thinking about portfolio management, the GPs are thinking about how do I build relationships in this space? Um, how do I offer my investors liquidity? And so they've created transactions mm -hmm. that they can bring to their LP base, offer them distributions, um, hold on to good assets a little bit longer. And at the end of the day, it's a mutually beneficial transaction. So this has led to a lot of the growth in the market, but it's also catapulted secondaries into more of a mainstream type of category. For us and what we saw early on, mm -hmm. I, I think you have to think about who we are as Hamilton Lane and where we fit in the ecosystem. Sure. On this, you have the fund managers and household names that everybody knows, yeah. other managers that you may not know. On this side, you have the, the investors. Those investors are trying to figure out how to access this market. Hamilton Lane sits squarely right in the middle of all of that. And our clients are the our customers of the clients that are trying to really access those managers. And so what that affords us is this front uh, row seat of the private markets. Mm -hmm. We're seeing everything that's happening. And what we saw back then was this growing market, but there was a challenge. And the challenge was if you wanted liquidity, it was really tough to get. And on top of that, we were going through the dot-com era. Right. We were going through the global financial crisis. There's a lot of challenges within private market portfolios that's where the private that's where the secondary market emerged to answer a lot of those concerns and questions 
And that's really how the secondary market got built, off of those challenges and off of those downturn cycles. Well, of course, that's what they always say, right? And right is out of the challenges that come out opportunities and innovation. And speaking of the front row seat, let's uh, just zoom in a little bit on what you're seeing so far this year. Um, th there is a Pitchburg article that predicted that private equity secondaries are set to boom in 2023. And that same article actually uh, quoted your colleague, Tom Kerr, the global head of secondaries at Hamilton Lane, who said the following, the tailwinds in terms of deal flow and volume and activity for secondaries have never Ever been stronger. So, Ryan, what are you seeing in terms of deal flow? Um, and I guess my question is, are you seeing more GPs, more LPs become more motivated sellers this year versus last? Yeah. So, so far, we've talked a lot about transaction volume. Uh, we were talking about those stats earlier and what has led to a lot of that transaction volume. Uh, the better indicator about the momentum behind this market is the deal flow. You said it. Um, and um, Tom is right. This is a particularly attractive market environment. And, and we're seeing that in our deal flow. We saw a record amount of deal flow last year, $240 billion of opportunities that our secondary team screened. What got done in the market was, according to Jeffries, $108 billion. Mm -hmm. That's what just got done and cleared. Gap. Huge gap. It's the biggest gap that we've seen between mm -hmm. what we're seeing and what's actually getting done. So. This is a common misperception about this market. It's grossly undercapitalized. Uh, there, and on top of that, it, the, the supply demand picture gets better. Um, not only is it undercapitalized, but you have a lack of relevant uh, competitors in this space. Uh, really interesting stat was 50% of all that market volume is coming from four of the largest secondary players in this market. If one of those four secondary players either slows down deployment or steps back off of the market, that dramatically swings this supply demand dynamic even further in favor of the buyer. So this is an overarching theme of the market today and really why we're excited. Right, so there's this huge gap, as you mentioned, between the deal flow and what's actually again done in the market. And is that just a function of not enough funds being available to allocate to P secondaries or is it a function of pricing? And maybe the LPs are now willing to take the discounts uh, and you know, P secondary funds are looking for a better entry point. So I'm, I guess I'm curious, which one of these drivers do you expect to play out to close the gap between supply and demand? Yeah, pricing is obviously a big component of this market. Um, going from 2021 to 2022, average pricing fell about 10 points. But we have to take a step back in time and maybe go to July time period of last year and really see what was happening in the market. And the supply story was LPs being over allocated to this asset class. Um, one thing that we tell all of our clients is even through different, more difficult market cycles, you have to maintain a, com a consistent commitment pacing to this asset class. That's a really tough thing to do when you're over allocated to private equity. Um, and so what LPs needed to do was reduce exposure and they came to the secondary market to alleviate that. Uh, and if you were a seller and you came to market in July, you were met with buyers that were very cautious mm -hmm. uh, of what was happening in the market. And so some kind of took a step back when that happened, pricing fell even further from the mid 90s to the lower 80s. We were ready in Q4 for this opportunity and, um, and we were met by uh, a number of LPs that were willing to transact at that 20 to 25 discount range. Right. But the headline, do you think we've seen the worst of the discounting already or do you think we'll see something like 30, 40% discounts that we saw during the financial crisis? Tough to say. It's, it's really driven by some of the macro um, perception in the market today. Um, we've seen it stabilize, I would say, over the last quarter or so. Okay. Um, but if the environment continues to deteriorate and there's still mo moments of volatility, yes, um, we could see that. The biggest thing is that LPs need capital and they don't have enough of it today in their portfolios. And so they're feeling pressure. And as long as that, uh, that pressure persists, we're going to see some good discounts. That's going to be an opportunity for potentially further discounting. So Ryan, just kind of take a step back and looking at the bigger picture. Today, the assets under management for P secondary funds is somewhere around $400 billion. Um, So I assume this is going to grow pretty rapidly as the private markets, private equity markets uh, grow. But I'm curious, how would you 
position PE secondaries as a part of private clients' portfolios today? Is it uh, a need to have? Is it a nice to have? Why should somebody have PE secondaries in their portfolio? Yeah, well, there's a lot of reasons um, that you should have secondaries in your portfolio, and that's coming from from the the secondary person. Um, <laughs> we overall think it's it's an important part of clients' portfolios, but we also think it's a really important part of the asset class. It is vital for private markets to continue to grow. I'll give you a really interesting stat uh, that we came across, um, and this was out of uh, Jeffrey's more recent report. 50% of all the sellers last year were first-time sellers in the secondary market. And there's not a lot of good data around this next stat, but we would estimate there's 200 limited partners that sold last year. There are thousands and thousands of limited partners all over the world. So what if that number went to 500 or 1,000? So we think that there's a tremendous growth opportunity in this market, but it doesn't matter if you're a buyer or seller. We think this is an important part of the market. Well, it's a very important part of the market because, as you mentioned, if you're going to allocate your private equity, you want to be able to have some liquidity valve, and this provides such a significant potential exit for those LPs looking to exit. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for sharing your insights today and for joining me on the desk today. Really tremendous perspective on the state of the PE secondaries market. We really appreciate it. Next up, we sit down with our Capital Senior Vice President of Research and Education, Sean Hasnat, to discuss opportunities in the private commercial real estate. Welcome back and thank you for joining us today. My next guest is Sean Hasnat, Senior Vice President of Research and Education at iCapital with a focus on real assets. Uh, welcome, Sean, and thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. It's great to see you and I'm glad we have a chance to talk about the commercial real estate market because it is no secret and there's no, been no shortage of headlines that talk about stress, dislocation, concerns about the state of the commercial real estate market. We've got the Fed hiking rates once again, you know, to five and a quarter percent. Transaction volumes are falling. So there's kind of a lot to unpack there. So just to kick us off, I know you wrote this article recently that looked at the state of the commercial real estate market today, the dislocation, the opportunities. So just why Talk us through high level. What is the state of commercial real estate today? Yeah, so we're certainly entering a more challenging environment for commercial real estate. The most recent data that we have shows that private real estate declined by about 5% over the last two quarters. Um, and it, there are two reasons for this. First is cap rates, which is effectively yield on properties. And cap rates tend to move with interest rates with a lag. So after falling steadily for about two years, that trend reversed in the second half of 2022 as the Fed continued to aggressively increase interest rates. Sure. And that's put pressure on real estate valuations down. The second is real estate is highly dependent on debt. And we have about a trillion dollars of commercial real estate loans that are maturing over the next two years. Most of that is gonna be, have to be refinanced at significantly higher interest rates. Combine that with lower real estate valuations and tighter lending standards, and you have a funding gap, which is causing a lot of the concerns in the real estate market that we're seeing today. Right, and it's certainly playing out in the headlines. And you know, we hear not almost every day, but it feels like almost every day, a headline about this commercial real estate default or another. And so, you know, what do you think is right? You know, is it the headlines that paint a more dire picture, or are you seeing silver linings in this market? Well, the silver lining we believe is that the headlines are are not as accurate as as we as we think they are. There is to be sure distress in, in the market, but most of that seems to be very sector and asset specific rather than systemic, particularly in the office sector is where much of what we're reading about is, is, is really focused on. And we see an opportunity here to come in and acquire mispriced assets as, at, at attractive valuation. So this could be a very interesting situation for investors trying to capitalize on, on the stress in the market. I think everybody who's listening to this loves this idea of buying a mispriced asset. We always look for those, you know, because, you know, usually in the market, you have a lot of things that are priced in. So any chance we can identify a mispricing, we want to take advantage of it. So where exactly are the mispricings in the real estate market? Because it sounds like maybe it is fair that commercial real estate prices corrected as rates went up and uh, rent market rent growth, for example, slowed down. But where are those mispricings today? 
So we're going to see a lot of mispricings, particularly in in asset classes or in, in sectors where there is that funding gap I just talked mm -hmm. about. So essentially owners of real estate have three options. They can extend and modify the loans, or mm -hmm. at least try to with their lenders. They can inject more equity to recapitalize the asset, which is difficult in this environment. And third is take a haircut and sell those assets. So investors that are coming in can potentially identify good assets that they can get at significantly uh, lower prices. And those are properties that maybe still have solid fundamentals, but there's a loan that maybe had an interest rate of three and a half percent and has to be refinanced at something like a seven percent rate. And Absolutely. obviously that's not sustainable. Uh, so again, we do like identify those mispricing. So that's great. But for investors who are looking to capitalize on those, as you look across the real estate spectrum, what are the strategies, investment strategies that we can think about that take advantage of what you just talked about? Yeah, so the real estate spe spectrum goes from core, core plus, all the way up to opportunistic real estate. Core and core plus tends to be focusing on more stabilized assets and where the returns come primarily from rental income. It's a more lower risk, lower re return strategy, and it's much more correlated to interest rates because it behaves like a fixed income. At the far end, you have the opportunistic real estate. And opportunistic real estate really tries to take advantage of market dislocations and stress in the market and acquire real estate at, at a discount to its replacement value. So we believe in this environment, the most attractive strategy for a real estate investor is opportunistic real estate because of the stress and dislocations we're likely to see in, in areas like office and hotels, as well as the more fundamentally driven strengths in multifamily and industrials that have pulled back recently mm -hmm. because of some sh short-term supply dynamics. So we think that opportunistic real estate would be a great way to play all of the market environment that we're seeing today. Right, so some of those opportunistic managers are definitely going to be looking for those pockets of repricing, whether it's an office or whether it's a multifamily or logistics. Um, and just to kind of sum it up and do a bottom line for us, you know, you brought up fixed income. You know, cash pays 5% or a little bit more. And, you know, lots of parts of fixed income are also offering a pretty decent yield. And, you know, when you think about commercial real estate, the core aspect, the core part of it, historically yielded four and a half, five percent pretty consistently. But what should investors expect from opportunistic real estate in terms of potential returns? Yeah, so opportunistic real estate, I think, should be offering investors mid teen returns in this environment. This is really an environment that's conducive to this type of strategy. And we think the vintages that are going to come out of this cycle right here are going to be one of the best returning for a long time. Well, I think everyone listening to this can get excited about mid-teens potential IRRs on opportunistic real estate. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for your insights. And we look forward to seeing the article on the state of the commercial real estate and so much good information in this conversation and beyond it. Uh, thanks again. Well, coming up, five questions to ask before making a private market investment. Welcome back. Here at Beyond 6040, in addition to keeping a finger on the pulse of the market, we also believe in the importance of helping investors build a foundational understanding of the investing landscape. And new financial technology platforms are making it possible for high net worth individuals to access private market investments that were previously only available to institutional investors. But private market investments have distinct characteristics and risks that are quite different from traditional investments. So here are five questions to ask before making a private market investment. First, what is your time horizon? Private market investments take years to mature are you comfortable with a longer term investment? Second, can you afford illiquidity? Private investments have the potential for enhanced returns, but the long term time horizon should be a key consideration for investors with liquidity needs today. Third, where does this investment fit in the overall portfolio? Private market investments can offer a variety of benefits to a portfolio such as higher return potential, lower correlations to the public markets, and diversification. And fourth, are you comfortable with less transparency into performance? Private market investments are inherently more difficult to value, and it can be hard to quantify until investments are sold in the later half of the fund's life. 
And this is why due diligence prior to investing is so important. And fifth, do you understand the private market fund pricing structure? Investors should make sure they understand concepts such as capital commitments, drawdowns, and performance fees, which are all components that are unique to private market investments. So there you have it, the five questions to ask before making a private market investment. For more insights and answers to these questions, visit our insights and education page at iCapital.com. I'm Anastasia Amoroso, and thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on Beyond 6040. Thank you.